Welcome back to Face the Nation. We want to go now to CBS senior foreign correspondent Liz Palmer in London on how tough restrictions in parts of Europe seem to be successful. Good morning. Well, there's some good news for a change from Europe today. The widespread lockdowns have worked and the COVID infection rate is coming down, which means that some of those restrictions are now being lifted. Employees at the main Paris department store welcomed customers for the first time in a month. This applause signals relief that holiday shopping can at last begin. Germany's businesses will postpone opening up for a while yet. For example, eat-in restaurants have to stay closed for three more weeks. But how about this next-level takeout? The Neumünster Cooking School offers five-star curb service. You just have to come in your own RV. It's not so festive on Europe's ski slopes. Most of them will stay shut until at least January. Though Switzerland, where there is already plenty of snow, is bucking the trend. There's a winter wonderland in Moscow, too. But skaters have to glove up and go through so-called disinfection booths to glide around this year on the vast rink in Red Square. Russia's infection rate, unlike Europe's, is surging up nearly 30% this month. Compare that with Australia. Beaches are full. Overhead, but out of sight, drones watch for overcrowding. But people are relaxed with reason. After months of severe restrictions, the virus is under control. Only eight cases in the past 24 hours. Oh, oh, did you hear that? And finally, there's a new COVID Christmas ritual. Virtual visiting with Santa. Ho, ho, ho. And it does appear that the magic works just as well clear through the screen. Here in Britain, the vaccine rollout looks imminent. Some of the papers are reporting this morning it could go ahead with the Pfizer version of the vaccine as early as the 7th of December. Margaret? Liz, thank you. We want to go now to former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who joins us from Westport, Connecticut. He sits on the board at Pfizer, one of the drug companies preparing a vaccine. Good morning to you. Uh, you Good could morning. you could really hear the concern in Dr. Burks's description of what she thinks is about to hit this country. Uh, you look at South Dakota; it was the latest case to see one COVID death for every 1,000 residents. Is the whole country going to look like South Dakota? Hopefully not. I think parts of the country are going to be able to um, do better than the Midwest is doing and certainly better than South Dakota and North Dakota are doing. If you see what's happening in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states where governors took more aggressive steps early, where there's more consistent use of masks, where they took less infection going into this season, I think you're going to see infection remain, rates remain lower than we're seeing in other parts of the country like the Midwest. Also, there's a lot of testing available here. So they're taking more aggressive steps to try to contain the infection. If you look at states like South Dakota and the Midwest generally, you're starting to see the number of new infections slow. And that's a reflection of the fact that they have fully infected at least 30 percent of the population in states like South Dakota, and maybe as high as 50 percent if you look at some of the modeling. So at some point, you have such a high rate of infection in these parts of the country that you're going to see a natural slowing of new infections because the people who are eligible to be infected, who are vulnerable, have already gotten the virus. I mean, is that the strategy, the federal strategy to just hope for the best? Well, look, quite frankly, that's been the strategy of some people, this so-called herd immunity strategy. They don't say that explicitly, but some people think that you really can't stop this virus. and We just have to let it run its course and do our best to protect those who are vulnerable. We're not doing a very good job of protecting the vulnerable. Almost 8 percent of all nursing home residents have perished as a result of this pandemic since the start of the year. But um, there are some people who don't think you can really fully stop this virus. I disagree with that. I think you look at parts of the country, look at New York, look at my home state of Connecticut. Um, there's a lot of infection here. These states are pressed right now. But you're not seeing the widespread rates of transfer that you're seeing in other parts of the country that haven't taken more aggressive steps. And I would argue that the economy in South Dakota and parts of the country that let this run a little bit more and didn't really take aggressive steps, didn't put in place mask mandates, didn't close congregate sayings like bars and restaurants, I don't think there's really evidence that they've done better economically than parts of the country that took more prudent steps. What's really keeping consumers home is the virus. Why, why people aren't going out to eat is they don't want to go into restaurants and risk getting infected. It's not the mandates and the state action that's keeping people home. It's the infection.
Mm -hmm. The CDC is considering shortening the amount of recommended time for a quarantine. What does that accomplish? Well, look, I think this is a prudent step. I think we should have contemplated this earlier because the reality is most people who get exposed to COVID are going to come down with COVID, um, who get exposed to coronavirus, will come down with COVID within a short period of time, figure five to seven days. There are some outliers. And some people, there is evidence that some people won't contract the infection until a full 14 days after exposure. But what you want are recommendations that are prudent and practical that people are going to follow. And when you have a 14-day quarantine period, that's such a long period of time that a lot of people aren't going to follow that anyway. And it makes it difficult to adhere to recommendations. And so putting in place a 10-day quarantine period, even a 7-day quarantine period, you're going to capture the vast majority of infections within that time frame. So I think you need to balance the practicality of what you're recommending um, with people's ability and willingness to comply with it. You need a degree in psychology to uh, figure out how to get people to comply these days. Dr. Fauci said on another network this morning, there's not enough vaccine right now to vaccinate healthcare workers next month. That's the reason why this happens, uh, that it goes to the states, that the amount of vaccine gets shipped locally, and then the final decision of how to do that properly will be left up to the states. What does he mean? What, what should be the deciding factor in who gets the vaccine? And are we short on supply already? We are short on supply. We're, we're not going to have enough supply to vaccinate everyone who could be eligible for this vaccine and who could benefit it from, certain, from it, certainly. The federal government this week on December 1st is going to make recommendations. A vaccine advisory committee that advises CDC will make recommendations on who should get the vaccine first, the so-called 1A group, the people who should get it immediately when it becomes available, hopefully in, in December, if there's one or more authorization of vaccines this month, including from the company I'm on the board of, Pfizer. That's going to be healthcare workers and, and residents of long-term care facilities. So there's about 20 million healthcare workers who might be eligible and about 3 million residents of long-term care facilities and staff of those facilities. Those will be the first group of patients who get access to it. Um, that's pretty much decided. They're going to vote on it this week, but I wouldn't be, I'd be very surprised if they deviate from that. But there's only going to be 40 million doses available um, throughout the whole month of December if both companies get authorized on time. So there's probably not enough vaccine to work fully through both of those groups. And then there's a question of who's going to be in that second tranche, what we're calling 1B. And there is some debate mm -hmm. whether that's going to be older Americans, those over the age of 65 or 75, or certain essential workers or some combination of both. There's about 85 million essential workers who might be eligible to be vaccinated if you, if you bifurcate it to that group. And there's mm -hmm. about 50 million people over the age of 65, 20 million over the age of 75. Yeah. And so that's going to be some debate about which group gets prioritized first. When Dr. Burke says vaccinate for impact, what does that mean? Well, it depends on what impact you're trying to achieve. If, you're, if your goal is to maximize the preservation of human life with a vaccine, then you would you would bias the vaccine towards older Americans. You would try to get everyone over the age of 75 vaccinated first. There's about 20 million of, of those in that group. Okay. If your goal is to reduce the rate of infection, you would prioritize essential workers. So it depends on what impact you're trying to achieve. And a lot of that is going to rest on the shoulders of state governors. Uh, we'll be covering this. Dr. Gottlieb, That's thank right. you for your insight. We'll be right back. On Thanksgiving, many of us enjoyed an abundance of food, but more than 50 million people in this country are unsure of where their next meal is coming from, according to Feeding America. That is the nation's largest hunger relief organization, and its CEO, Claire babineau Fontano joins us from Dallas this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Your organization says as a result of the pandemic, one in six Americans could face hunger. Where are you seeing the most need? Wow, what is really staggering is the fact that that's on average across the country. There are actually communities in which one in two children face food insecurity. What we're seeing is the things that you might imagine. So communities of color are particularly vulnerable. They're two times more likely to suffer with food insecurity. Also rural communities are far more likely to suffer with food insecurity as well. So it's definitely not evenly spread, but on average, about one in six people in this country food insecure. That's right. That is staggering. Uh, 17 million of them children. How much of that is coming from school closures? Well, it's a combination of things, actually. About 22 million children in the country uh, before COVID relied upon free and reduced lunch. Um, it consistently is true that 
families with children are far more likely to suffer from food insecurity. So there are lots of things conspiring right now to cause vulnerable communities to really be reeling right now, not only with a, um, a health crisis, but with a food crisis as well. I want to talk not just about describing the problem, but, but some of the suggestions you might have on solutions here. Um, I, I know that states were ordered last month to uh, do the most they possibly can in terms of providing money for food stamps. The typical payment, according to the USDA, is for a family of four to get $680 to last for a month. Um, according to your organization, a third of the customers you are seeing at your food banks don't even qualify for food stamps. What does that suggest to you about how out of a line uh, the states and the federal government is with the absolute need you're seeing on the front lines? Yeah, well, I'm so glad you started there because that's one of the solutions. Was, that's something we could do right now that could help families that are struggling. So not only do we have many people who turn to us for help or people who don't qualify, but barely don't qualify under current guidelines, but we also have a number of people who turn to us for help who qualify, but what they receive does not satisfy their needs for their families because of things like what you said. I want to throw out one more statistic, if you, won't, if you don't mind, which is that the Euro, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics just said that uh, grocery prices right now are at a 50-year high, mm -hmm. and we're simply not tracking with those increases in demand and, and lower supply uh, when it comes to the federal nutrition program. So that's something that we should definitely be looking at at changing. Cost of living just higher than what the social safety net is. I, I know you've been in contact with the Biden administration, um, incoming administration, and I know there's a debate among some Democrats right now about whether to refocus in some ways the agricultural department on this question of hunger versus the traditional focus on rural America. W what would you advise the incoming administration? I'd start by saying that's a false choice. Um, the need is so great out there. We ought to be doing both. There's absolutely a role for the federal nutrition programs to play. That role, in fact, should be enhanced. And there's also a role for our, our U.S.-based uh, growers and, and producers to play. I'll give you as one quick example. Um, the uh, USDA commodities represented about 1.7 billion meals of the 5 billion meals that our network was able to provide last year. If nothing happens, with no intervention, we're looking at a 50 percent decrease in those commodities next year, while we're seeing a 60 percent increase in demand. I, I, I really believe that we need to be thoughtful about how we look at near-term solutions, mid-term solutions, and long-term solutions. And as I said, I believe that's really a false choice. Well, in the near term, we know uh, the CARES Act, uh, a lot of its support to Americans runs out at the end of December, leaving potentially almost 7 million people pending eviction, 12 million Americans without unemployment benefits. What is that going to do? Are your food banks prepared to meet what is potentially a lot of new need? Well, I'll tell you, I, I'll bet on this network of remarkable people to do everything that they can all the time. But the simple truth is there's no way that the charitable food system can do this alone. It's going to require, it's an all-in fight. It's going to require um, policy interventions, regulatory interventions. It's also public-private partnerships. I think we've mm -hmm. got to get really serious about about doing something about this, because in our country, we actually have the resources and the ingenuity that's necessary to really solve these problems, as yeah. nuanced and complex as they are. Well, good luck to you and your organization. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We know worldwide more than a quarter of a billion people are likely to be acutely hungry in 2020, and this crisis is getting worse. The UN's World Food Program is the world's largest organization addressing hunger and promoting food security. And we go now to its executive director, David Beasley. He joins us from Florence, South Carolina. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. That is a staggering estimate in terms of the number of people uh, on the verge of acute hunger, and you say 270 million on the precipice of starvation. How much of this is due to the pandemic? 
Well, quite a bit of it. In fact, about uh, half of that is due to the pandemic. Uh, when I joined the World Food Program a few years ago, the number of people that were marching toward the brink of starvation was about 80 million people. But over the past three years, pre-COVID, it spiked up to 135 million. Then you asked the question why, and the primary reason was man-made conflict compounded with climate extremes and fragile, fragile governments. But since COVID has come in and truly exacerbated every extenuating circumstance we had around the world, the number has gone from 135 million from one year ago to 270 million people marching to the brink of starvation. This is not people going to bed hungry. This is people really struggling to get their next meal. You warned recently that the coming year, 2021, could bring famines of biblical proportions. Where specifically are you most concerned? Well, there's about 36 countries now that we feed 30 million people that they depend on us 100%. We assist about 100 million people on any given day, week, or month right now around the world. We need to move that number up to about 138 million. But there are three dozen countries, and you talk about specifically, let me just hit a few, mm -hmm. uh, Yemen, uh, Assyria, uh, South Sudan, Northeast Nigeria, DRC, and I could keep going from country to country to country around the world. In fact, and if we don't address this, Margaret, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at famines, destabilization, and mass migration. And it's a lot cheaper to come in and prevent it and do it right. I mean, you know if people in the United States are struggling uh, for food, what do you imagine is happening in Niger, Burkina Faso, or South Sudan? You know, the, the U.S taxpayer is the uh, single largest donor to the UN's World Food Program. But we are going through a crisis here at home. You just heard how painful it is. Um, what impact do you think that economic strain is going to have on the U.S. ability to give to your organization? Well, it's extremely important. That's one of the things I'm talking with leaders around the world, especially the United States, who is our number one donor, as well as European leaders. You know, when you go back to the Syrian war, the European leaders did not step in at the right time, at the right place, and they paid a severe price. The Syria was a nation of about 20 million people. The cost of supporting the Syrian in Syria is about 50 cents per day. That same Syrian ends up in Berlin or Brussels or London is 50 to 100 euros per day. And we know that people don't want to leave home, but if they don't have food and they don't have some degree of peace and stability, they will do what any of us would do for our children. So it's a lot cheaper to come in and prevent the destabilization than it is to have war and conflict afterwards. And the United States has always been the most generous nation mm -hmm. on earth. And I don't expect the United States to back down now because this could be a lot cheaper to come in and do it right and prevent a lot of migration and a lot of destabilization and, in fact, a lot of deaths from hunger. People are dying now. About every five seconds, a child dies from hunger. I mean, by the time you and I finish talking, Margaret, we're mm -hmm. going to have several dozen children have died from hunger. Before you were a humanitarian, um, you were uh, a Republican governor in South Carolina. You were a politician, so I know you know uh, the politics in this country right now, and you understand the complaints from President Trump uh, in regard to the U.S. taking on too much of a burden and outsized responsibility when it comes to solving the world's problems. How do you respond to that argument now at this time of need in this country? Well, one of the things that I have found when it comes to international aid, strategic, effective international aid, I call it the miracle on Pennsylvania Avenue at both ends. You know, when it seems like the Democrats and Republicans, Margaret, they're fighting over everything. But when it comes to food aid and stabilizing nations and preventing famine, it's remarkable to watch the Republicans and the Democrats come together, lay aside their differences, and literally do what they can. And it's been quite a miracle to see. We went from about 1.9 billion when I arrived three and a half years ago to now about almost $4 billion in the United States. And so whether you talk about Bush, Obama or Trump, and I know Biden, we'll have, we will have the support we need from Republicans and Democrats to help the needy people around the world. But this is a yeah. one-time extraordinary crisis. And we're gonna have, actually, we're gonna have to okay. ask the billionaires to step up in a way they've never done before. All right, uh, Mr. Beasley, thank you for your time. Congratulations to the World Food Program on the Nobel Peace Prize you're about to receive. We'll be back in a well, moment.
Finally today, CBS News foreign correspondent Holly Williams spent Thanksgiving week embedded with the U.S. military in Iraq and Syria as they worked to prevent ISIS from regrouping. Here's her report. Okay. In eastern Syria, the 82nd Airborne Division is patrolling to stop an ISIS resurgence. It's thought that thousands of extremists are still at large, but Lieutenant Colonel Val Morrow told us the small American presence, about a thousand troops, prevents ISIS from showing its face. Well, Holly, they gotta hide. <laughs> they're, they're, there's not, there's, they're still here. It's not a whole lot of them. But the fanatics are still out there, and, and that's who we're going after. It's considered low level sabotage. They... To stop ISIS regaining control of lucrative oil facilities like this one, they're guarded by America's Syrian allies, the same ragtag army that beat back ISIS on the ground. But last year, President Trump opened the door to an incursion by Turkey into this area, quickly followed by Russians who moved through this base after the US military withdrew. It's led to direct confrontations between American and Russian forces and outright chaos, which could provide an opening for ISIS, according to Kino Gabriel, a spokesman for America's Syrian allies. Uh, instability equals uh, the best environment for uh, jihadist for terrorist organization to prosper. What was the target? Across the border in Iraq, the number of U.S. troops was almost halved to 3,000 in September. And this month, the Pentagon announced another cut of 500 by January. As we kind of scope down force protection measures and, and, uh, and smaller footprint. General Ryan Rideout told us it won't impact operations, but critics say the cuts give a boost to militia groups in Iraq that are backed by Iran. They've launched scores of rockets targeting Americans this year alone, including in Baghdad this month. They just simply want to stay in charge. They simply want to continue to, to, to have power and money and control. With the American presidency in transition, this unstable region is even more complicated than it was four years ago. Our Holly Williams reporting from Iraq. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.